right. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is week two of, of a coffee chat with the uh, Gallo and Company. I'm John Gallo, and with me is Eric Ma. Hey, guys. How's it going? So we're into what? Week week eight of COVID? Yeah, week week seven week. of COVID-19? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Certainly this week, uh, we have someone in the in the waiting room. This week, we've had a few new announcements. Um, we're going to focus on three... Three announcements. Most of them are updates. Some things, some significant changes, and then we'll open it up uh, for a chat. Some instructions are in the chat room about how to how to participate and ask questions. What we've done a little differently this week um, is we're allowing people to unmute themselves and ask the questions. Um, that I, we just think there's a, a few less participants, so it's a little more manageable. If it becomes unmanageable, then we'll uh, we'll ask you to raise your hand inside the, uh, the chat box. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you hit you hit your manage participants on the bottom of your screen. That will allow you to have the access to raise your hand and then we'll manage it from there. But until we get you know overwhelmed, we'll let you just un unmute yourself and start talking. Um, anything to add, Eric? Uh, I think that's just about everything. It's just a reminder that when you do speak and um, uh, when you ask us your questions, if you use your voice, you will be recorded. Um, from what we understand of how the session gets recorded, your face is right now as it stands is not included in the okay. recording. So you can keep your 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 video on. That's all good. Um, but just to keep that in mind. Okay, thanks. So what, what was the new, what was the, the the new news this week that our prime minister has announced? It's changed. So there's a, there's a couple changes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big ones is the change to the serve. To yep. serve, um, there was a uh, change to how much you could earn during the COVID periods, um, up to a thousand dollars of in earnings for each period. Uh, then there was also the change to the loan, the four thousand yep. dollar loan, which we'll get into. We'll just do a quick overview. And then there's also uh, the like finalization of the emergency wage that uh, wage subsidy mm -hmm. that came out with um, you know uh, how revenues are calculated and stuff like that. Okay, well let's let's get it off. Let's start with the serve. Certainly, uh, you know, with this with this um, with COVID nineteen, we've seen the government uh, move quickly and adapt. And the biggest one of the biggest things I heard about the serve, which came out fairly efficiently early last week, was that you know if I earned a little bit of income, could I still apply for the serve? And certainly, with a lot of people at home and and the new economy, people are making a little bit of money. Uh, the federal government responded to that and they said yes. You can make up to a thousand dollars per period, uh, per one of the three periods, and still receive the serve. So, if you have a part-time job, uh, perhaps driving for Uber Eats uh, or what have you, as long as it doesn't exceed a thousand dollars, you can still get your serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, there, other than that, I don't think there was too many changes with the serve. I think that's just about no. It. Uh, from from our understanding, talking to clients, it, it, the role went really well. There were some people that actually got paid twice uh, on the CRA website. They did say. Don't worry about it. It'll it'll reconcile with your next period. However, if in the next period you're hired back um, or you earn more than a thousand dollars, you are required to repay the CERP. And they even said put out on their website how to repay. They want you to write a check to the government of Canada for the for your server amount, um, and then address it to their their Sudbury office uh, with the with the with the letter saying this is a repayment of a CERP for the specific period because you uh, you either went back to work. Or you receive more than a thousand dollars, so that's how they'd like you to be paid back. Um, and and if you do that, they, they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't come after you. Yeah. So let's move to the loan. Yeah. Let us give us the updates on the loan. That happened yesterday, so it's still very fresh. We're getting a lot of emails in the office about you know do I qualify now? Uh, should I apply? Um, so really interesting stuff. Yeah. So the biggest change is they reduced the floor before it was fifty thousand dollars in total payroll. They reduced that now to twenty thousand dollars in payroll. Um, big difference. I think the the feedback was that you know micro businesses were having a hard time. They couldn't apply for these loans. They just simply didn't make enough. Uh, they didn't have a big enough payroll, and these micro businesses were having a hard time achieving that. Um, they also increased the cap to one point five million mm -hmm. for how much the like the top end was. Um, with that, I think we're gonna see a lot more applications. I don't know if there's anything else to add about that. Yeah, I think a few things when we saw um, with people applying last week were they were confused about um, the employment number. So for those of you that do qualify now or didn't even attempt to uh, look into it, is 
meet box 14 or box 71 on your, on, your, on your T4 summary of your corporation or your payroll account. Um, I, I do want to highlight a few of the points with, um, with the loan. One is it's available to any entity that has a payroll account. So those um, uh, unincorporated entities or those proprietorships, if you had a payroll account or you have a payroll account, um, and you now meet the criteria between twenty thousand and one point five million, then certainly you can apply for the loan. So it's corporations, unincorporated, even charities. And I've we've had a couple questions. In fact, I dealt with one yesterday with a charity, and a charity certainly can apply, or a not-for-profit can apply. It's a little more stringent in terms of uh, some of the requirements. So if you are a charity and you have a payroll account, so you had em you have employees or had employees. Um, and the only additional criteria is you have part of your A, you've had to have filed your charity return or a corporate T2 or a T1040. Uh, and those, those that are charities, not for profits, will know what that means. But as well as some of your revenue had to be for the sale of goods or services. So it's, it's one of those charities, not for profits, actually sold something. So you could think, for example, maybe a, a hospital foundation that had. Um, uh, a retail queue inside the hospital selling teddy bears, flowers, stuff like that. So they had revenue in above of just donations, then they could certainly apply. Uh, it would apply to uh, a, a charity or not-for-profit, for example, that maybe um, ran uh, retail clothing stores or sold or collected clothes and then sold it to, to entities like the Goodwill, um, and they funded themselves like that. Golf courses uh, that are not-for-profits. Uh, could also apply for it as well. So it certainly opened that up. The last thing I, I do want to mention about the uh, the loan, the, the forty thousand dollars loan, is that there's a couple attestations there that are really interesting. One of them is that you have to agree that if you um, lie or, or you're going to be penalized, that they can make you public. So that means um, your your information become public. They can they can essentially publicly shame you. So um, Make sure that you fit you fit in within that. And two, if you don't, you try to get aggressive. Um, the public square will know. Yeah, for sure. Right? I think there's one other interesting one. Um, this loan isn't necessarily just used for just about anything, right? What yes. There's specific ruling as to what we can use the loan for. Great point. Great point, Eric. Um, they want you to use the loan to to pay for operating expenses, um, but they don't want you to use it for management salaries. Uh, to repay capital or anything where the owners might take a, a benefit. The intent of the loan is to keep the business going and to pay off third parties. So you pay your rent, your operating expenses, some of your fixed expenses, but you shouldn't be de-risking the shareholder or paying off other loans with that loan. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and I believe, I think that's just about everything with the loan. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It, it's a good change. Um, not much else to talk about there. I think the last thing that we want to take a look at, I'm not by far not the smallest for sure, is the is the wage subsidy. Yeah, I mean, our politicians work the weekend mm -hmm. to get this one out on Saturday, and um, it, though it's not open to apply for yet, it should be in about two weeks from now. They said three weeks on the weekend, so we're assuming uh, we're about two weeks away from the the, the portal. Our website or whatever they're going to use for the application process. Uh, how would you walk us through some of the, the key highlights of the wage subsidy? For sure, yeah. So I think one of the big questions that we get a lot is, do I qualify? Qualifying is such a, um, it, it's a little confusing, but I think Siri has done a really good job in providing an outline as to how that might work. So if I can, I'm just going to walk you guys through an example to how Siri is saying that, um, your wage or your your revenue drop should be calculated. Well, as while Eric gets prepared, I'll just highlight. Really, you have what I would call four different methodologies. One, you can make an average of January and February and apply that to the three periods that they're allowing for today, or you have or you have to compare same period, so the March period of 2020 to the March period of 2019, and then the April and the May slash June period. Further, you can choose to use the cash system or the accrual system. So basically, what money came into the bank or what invoices you booked. 
And whatever one of those four combination thereof you use, you have to be consistent for the complete period. So you can't play the game and use a cash system one month and accrual. So essentially you're, you're, you're kiting your receipts. Go ahead, Eric. All right. So one of the big ones that they want to talk about is how you use that, as John said, the January and February 2020 average in order to determine if you qualify. Now, this is kind of the one that adds a little bit more of a benefit for um, companies that may have not met the traditional 15% drop compared to last year. So the example they provide is that a company in January 2020 had a monthly revenue of $100,000. Then they say that in February, they had a re revenue of $140,000. This is for the 2020 year. Okay, so from these two numbers, we take the average, which we get is 200, total is 240 divided by two gives us our 120,000. Okay, so 120,000 is considered now our baseline. This baseline is used to calculate your current, the, the periods that you're gonna be looking at. And it will always be 120. That means for all periods that you're looking to uh, claim the emergency wage subsidy for. So we know that in March, they said that it would be a 15%. You, if you were experienced a 15% drop in revenue, you would, um, you would qualify for the benefit, which means if we take this average of 120 and we take essentially 85% of it, it's 15% drop, um, that gets us our... 100,000? 103, 100,000? Yeah. yeah. So about $100,000. So in the first, in the first, in for March, if you, if your revenue reported in March was $100,000 or less, then that means that, um, that means you do qualify. Okay. This is important because this is the part where it gets a little confusing. So if you qualified in for, uh, for March, you also qualify for uh, April, sorry, uh, April as well. So that means if you experience March's drop of, of below 100,000, you also qualify for April. What that then means is use the same $120,000 baseline to determine uh, May's drop as well. So what we know that May's is supposed to be a 30% drop, which means if you experience a drop to $84,000, $84,000 in um, in May, then you qualify, or in April, then you qualify for May. If that, if that that's how that works for the average of January and February. So the whole time, even if even if you don't qualify for, if you don't qualify for March, that's okay. You can still qualify for April. If you qualify for April, you also qualify for May. So whichever period you qualify, you qualify for that period and the one right after that as well. Perfect. So before before you you actually file, you should make sure you, you know whatever system you use will be the best system for the subsequent period as well. Now, it's a complicated, I won't say it's complicated, but certainly there's a lot of moving parts in this calculation, but we're, we actually uh, are here to help you. Um, if you went to our website, and as I talk, Eric's going to share, share our screen and show you where it is, but if you went to our COVID-19 webpage, we just put up uh, an Excel document that, that will help you run through the actual calculations. So as you can see, um, the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy uh, Excel worksheet, the one that's highlighted, will be the one that you can you can use to um, do the calculations and see if you actually qualify. Okay, thank you, Eric. Yeah, for sure. One of the, one of the other things I want to mention about about the, uh, the the emergency wage subsidy is that the CPP and EI benefits that the corporation pays are a hundred percent reimbursable. So on top of the 75% of the wage, you'll also get 100% of the corporation's uh, CPP and EI for those eligible employees. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, for sure. Is there anything else you want to talk to, talk to us about uh, on, on the emergency wage subsidy with regards to the payments of employees if their salaries have been reduced? Yeah, so I guess one of the things that's important to note, uh, one, of the, one of the original, um, one of the original rules was that an employee who received the CERB was not eligible to receive the deduction for um, the temporary wage subsidy. That meant that essentially you had to either choose to not work and get CERB or to work and uh, have, 
you know, for the employer to have the, um, the wage subsidy. They've actually changed that somewhat in order to say that if an employee, um, an employee's eligibility is based on a weekly basis for a full week period, that basically meant that they would be eligible for the uh, wage subsidy if they met 50% of the, if they worked 50% of the period um, for so two weeks, essentially, which allowed them to qualify for CERB if they uh, qualify for CERB first and also receive the wage benefit. Uh, the wage, sorry, the wage subsidy. So that was an important distinction, um, and it was a great move to allow for people to still, you know, end up with a, a fair wage while still working and work sharing as well to keep operations going. Thank you, Eric. There's two other things I like to highlight when it comes to the, to the wage subsidy. Uh, the next is the fact that uh, if you're a corporation that has a bunch of corporations or you're a large corporate group. You have the option to calculate your revenue drops either on a consolidated basis or uh, on an individual basis or individual corporation basis. But whatever methodology you choose, you have to be consistent throughout all the periods. I see we have a question. Yeah. So it says, what, is si what if sales doesn't drop, but your cost of goods double due to COVID? Yeah, great question. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't matter. Um, the, it's, it's a revenue-based threshold, not an expense-based threshold. So if, for example, um, because you're buying a lot of your cost of goods out of the U.S. and the U.S. dollar has, has uh, the, the disparity between the U.S. and Canadian dollars increased significantly, uh, your cost of goods or your inputs are, have doubled, uh, that will not help you uh, with the wage subsidy. Or alternatively, you have to take additional measures uh, or expenses to maintain operations. It will not. It will not assist you. Um, I think the government's comments on that would be: this is what the forty thousand dollar loan is for. It's to help you with with those costs. Uh, however, um, forty thousand dollars doesn't go very far. Any more questions at this point? No, I don't think so. Not at this point. Okay. Uh, the other the other thing that I want to talk to talk about on, on the on the on the, uh, the wage subsidy is that. Um, once again, the penalties uh, for abuse of it are quite high. First of all, you're required to pay 100% of it back. Secondly, uh, there's a 25% penalty if you manipulated your revenues and a 50% penalty um, if you manipulated the employees. So up to 100% of the payment plus a 75, so 175% penalty. So uh, the government, and once again, they can make, you pub make your name public, which not only show that you 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 know you, you use the program inappropriately, but also uh, that you had some drop in revenues and you, and you're suffering at this time. So once again, they're trying to incentivize people to play um, within the rules, uh, generous programs, but don't be abusive. For sure, yeah. I think one other thing to note is in the attestation, you also agree that you that you agree to a post uh, benefit survey as well. So even if it's not uh, even if you're not publicly shamed or anything like that, you do volunteer to uh, report on the whole process. What the survey says or asks, I'm not entirely sure, mm -hmm. um, but you do agree to that when you when you sign your attestation. Okay. Um, a few of the questions that, that we've received uh, in the last few days is around dividends. They're saying if you dividend if, if you didn't have employees, um, whether it's for the forty thousand dollar benefit or the employee wage subsidy. Uh, dividends, ineligible dividends paid to the owners of the company, will that apply? Uh, what we saw, uh, so the, the short answer is no, but what we're hearing is, as we saw with the CERB, where they, brought, they allowed the eligible dividends to, uh, to apply for the application of the CERB, where do they understand it? They're certainly thinking about it. There is some discussion around it. And most likely, if there's going to be any movement, it's going to be around the $40,000 loan. So if you had ineligible dividends um, in between the range of $20,000 and $1.5 million, perhaps that will make you eligible for the loans. That certainly is not the law right now, but we are hearing that they are considering that. Sorry, there's just a question here. Um, it says, is there a timeline as to when you need to hire back employees if you have already laid off staff? No, none of these programs uh, requires you to rehire employees. In fact, the, the emergency wage subsidy is for the employees you have, the employees you hire back, or even new employees that you decide to bring on. 
Um, in terms of, of laws around bringing back uh, laid off staff, there are laws around that certainly, but they're not, they're not in the purview of the federal government and certainly not in the purview of finance. Um, I don't want to give legal advice, but uh, um, I, I, I do know initially if you used a traditional layoff system uh, with 60 days, the provincial government, Mr. Kenny, our premier, then extended to 120 days because of, of, of COVID-19. So the, the layoff, and, and I don't want to step on toes of, of labor lawyers, but um, you know, from one business owner to another, um, the, the rules as I understand them to be uh, is that if, you know, they can be laid off for 120 days. If they're not hired back within 120 days, it's deemed that, that um, you, you, it's, a, it's a permanent layoff, and then you're required to pay uh, the appropriate um, severance package and what have you. So uh, I would say consult with your lawyer, but my, my, my knowledge as of today is that you have 120 days from the day that you laid them off before you have to face that, that question, for that, that issue. All right, okay. Um, well, that's the updates for this week. We're not gonna drag it on any longer if, if there aren't any questions. So I'll maybe um, I'll add a few other points, not, not necessarily related to the programs, but some general questions or comments or discussions I've had with business owners. And while I finish with that, if there's any final questions, please put them up and we'll address them. A lot of, a lot of things that we're talking about this week now, I think is the initial shock uh, of what's happening is sort of settling in. Business owners are doing what they need to do to keep operations. They're saying, okay, John, um, what should we be thinking of? So one of the conversations we've had with a few of our clients is, what does the new future look like? What's the new operations look like? And they're certainly taking this time to right-size their, their business, whether it, it, it's, it's their team, uh, it's their, their expenses, or how they operate. So we're seeing a lot more technology coming into businesses. Um, and not just, not just the online stuff like this, but they're saying, well, you know, it seems like, you know, if, if we've lost revenues of X, but we have to lay off, you know, a multiple of that, so more people, as a percentage than revenue and we're doing okay, um, what's helping us be okay? And they're really rethinking their business. So we're seeing things um, like, you know, un unfortunately people that are staying around is they're, they're right sizing their, their salary for their, their, their cost expense. That one question about the cost of goods is, um, I think we're gonna see uh, a significant increase in, in our input costs in a variety of our businesses, mostly because of the US dollar uh, change and most likely we're going to see some manufacturing come back to Canada. So you, you need to start thinking about what does that look like for your business? What does it look like for pricing? And how do you right size your, your business? The next thing is uh, yesterday, the prime minister did, did, did announce um, discussions around commercial rent. That's, the, that's generally the next biggest expense inside a business outside of employees is, is the rent expense. Now uh, he did admit that it's, it's, in many ways, outside of his control, it's really a provincial issue. But it's interesting that it was mentioned yesterday. Um, and the question becomes, when are we going to see that sort of rent relief, rent discussion um, at, at the commercial level? We saw it with the provincial stuff. We saw the premiers of most of the province say um, no one's allowed to be kicked out of their homes, uh, at least I think believe until June 30th. Uh, and landowners uh, should just talk to, their, talk to the renters and come up with some, some discussion. And we saw with a lot of our clients who are the landowners is, you know, if, if, their, if their tenant could show an ROE uh, that, that showed they got laid off or they had reduced rent, there were some really helpful discussions. And I think they came to some collaborative, uh, collaborative solutions. But we're not seeing it at the commercial level because we, we haven't seen any real, quite frankly, relief from the banks. What we see in the banks do uh, at, at the commercial side is defer payments, but you still have to pay interest. If they're deferring the interest, they're just adding to the back. So they're actually making more money in the long run um, if you defer. So where does that help the landowner when they're talking to the commercial tenant? And it's not really there. So this is where you see uh, business owners and, and this, whether they own the land or, they, or, their, or their tenants inside of a commercial building say, listen, we need help with this. Or, you know, it's great that we have this staff subsidies, but we won't be able to open up again because we can't pay our rent. And the landowner is saying, we're going to have to walk away from our buildings. So hopefully that 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 um, I mean I think this I think that solution is four to six weeks out. So if you are someone who owns uh, owns commercial uh, real estate or you're a tenant, 
um, you're going to need to start having some some real communications with uh, with with the other party. We're seeing is you know uh, can you pay your operating operating costs so that at least the building can be maintained. Um, and if you can work, then what percentage of your rent can you pay so that the interest expense from the landowner side can be paid? Um, but those are those are tough those are tough tough discussions being had right now. That's only other points I wanted to discuss and kind of giving maybe some foreshadowing about what's going to happen next week. Were there any questions while I was talking? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, guys. Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna drag this on. Uh, you know how to get a hold of us. Uh, visit our website. At galonco.ca or email email myself or Eric. Both our our, our um, emails are on the website. Um, have a great weekend. I hear the weather's going to be great, and uh, we're all in this together. So stay happy, stay safe, and let's do business. <laughs>